Good evening, friends, and welcome to the first of a series in webinars on the general theme of Means of Grace, being presented to you this year by Interpreter Magazine and The Upper Room. We want to welcome folks. We know we've got people signed in from across the United States, and welcome. Um, we may have some folks from outside. We had some from some of our webinars last year, but wherever you're listening from, um, we're glad to have you here and hope that this will be a rich evening for you. I'm Kathy Noble, editor of Interpreter Magazine, and one of your hosts for these programs that we'll be doing about once a month throughout 2014. Um, Tom Alban is usually from the upper room is usually here with me, but he is away this evening, so we'll look forward to welcoming him back in March. This is the second year of a collaboration between Interpreter and United Methodist Communications and the Upper Room to support the spiritual journeys of United Methodists. We began these last year with a series called on prayer called Lord Teach Us to Pray. And as I said, we're continuing this year with the focus on the means of grace. Each issue of Interpreter will be looking at one or more of the practices and then complementing those will be this series of hour-long webinars. Tonight we're going to look at the means of grace as avenues of spiritual growth, and in the coming months we'll be looking at some, some specific pro practices. We'll also have a web page that will have archive programs, articles, and other materials, and that will be a debuting in about the next month as we're in transition to a new interpreter website, so that will be part of the new site. I am delighted to have four guests with me tonight that um, will be um, presenting um, information, or may, maybe they'll, we should say, carrying on a conversation. And I want to say now, and we'll remind you several times during the evening, we hope that you will also um, join in. Several of you have already found the chat room on the website. And so we invite you to um, comment on what you hear. If you have questions, um, you're welcome to post those. We'll, we'll try to keep an eye on what's up there and um, respond to those as we can. But we want you to be a part of this conversation, too, not just, not just listeners. Our guests tonight are um, the Reverend Steve Bryant. Uh, Stephen is the Special Assistant to the General Secretary for Central Conference Relations and Sustainable Resourcing Initiative at the General Board of Discipleship. That means he gets to all kinds of interesting things that include um, support for a growing network of annual conference publishing teams that are linked together across Africa, the Philippines, and Eurasia. Um, he's, he helps with publishing African authors for the Africa Church through the Africa Ministry Series and also helping certain seminaries gain access to theological content via electronic readers. From 1997 to 2009, Stephen served as world editor and publisher of The Upper Room. His favorite projects during that time included establishing the Africa Upper Room Ministries in South Africa and developing the Companions in Christ series, which we know a number of you have been participants that you have referred back to that at different times. Um, Stephen has also been the Executive Director of the Upper Room Program Ministries, Director of Spiritual Formation, and International Director of the Walk to Emmaus and Chrysalis Movements. He is a member of the Southwest Texas Conference, and um, we're glad to have you with us tonight, Stephen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Our second guest is the Reverend Beth Fender, who has been on the staff of the Illinois Great Rivers Conference since 2007 as coordinator of discipleship and new streams. In partnership with the New Streams team, she works to develop spiritual leaders who practice the means of grace and teach others to do that same through intentional discipleship formations that are customized for their churches. Beth also works with a number of other groups in the, in the conference. Um, she is a deacon with a secondary appointment to Grace United Methodist Church in Jacksonville, Illinois. So, Beth, you are with us remotely, as are many of our participants, but we want to say welcome to you. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. With us again, or back with us here in Nashville, is uh, the Reverend Stephen Mansker, who is a member of the Minnesota Conference. He was a pastor for 10 years until 1999, when he joined the staff of the General Board of Discipleship as Director of Wesleyan Leadership. 
Steve leads workshops and seminars on covenant discipleship, small group ministry in the Wesleyan tradition, and Wesleyan leadership theology and practice. Annually, he leads two events, and I know these are ones that people that participate in are very consider them very rich events, the Wesley Pilgrimage in England and Wesleyan Leadership Conference. He is the author of, of several books and will be sharing with us tonight, particularly from the Wesleyan perspective. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here. And our last guest, um, also in Illinois, is Howard Willard. Howard is a member of Willow Hill United Methodist Church. He's a very active um, layman in his, his church and also in his conference. He's a certified lay servant at Willow Hill. Um, but he's coming to us tonight as the current team lead for Disciple Bible Outreach Ministry at Pekin Federal Prison and is a board member of the Disciple Bible Outreach Ministry of Illinois. He's also been involved in youth ministry, and then in his spare time, he works for Caterpillar Global Mining in their marketing and product support area. So, Howard, we're glad to have you with us tonight. Great to be here, Kathy. Thanks. So we want to welcome you. Um, also working behind the scenes with us tonight are Sheila Mayfield and Lane Denson, and they're keeping this all so that we can have the program and, and come together tonight. So... As we begin tonight, um, I want to invite each of our guests to spend a few minutes just sharing an experience um, in which you can identify a way or ways in which practicing any of the means of grace, um, you experience that drawing you nearer to God or to neighbor. Now, these may have been something before you knew of the means of grace as the way we kind of categorize um, spiritual practices. They might be from your childhood. They might be something that happened last week. So we just want to begin getting a little bit acquainted with you and hearing a little of your your memories, um, your experience with the means of grace. So Stephen Bryant, we're going to start with you. Uh, okay, thank you, Kathy. Well, I was thinking back to my earlier my early years. Uh, that's where my mind went with this question, and I remember as a, as a youth, I, we were a part of First United Methodist Church in a small town in Texas, and. Uh, in high school, I decided it was about time for me to drop out of youth group. I remember my my father very gently, not requiring it, but strongly encouraging me to stay with it and to uh, that there would be value for me in doing so. And as, as simple as this sounds, I mean, Christian community is a, is a means of grace, and um, our participation in that and. And that, uh, being continuing to participate in that group, to sing in the choir on Sunday evenings, to experience the harmony of our voices, uh, to stay up late after those meetings and under the stars to talk about the deep things of life, that was all a means of grace for me. And it was really the beginning of my spiritual journey and my, my uh, kind of gradual awakening to the reality of God. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, and we're glad you stayed. Thanks. Glad you, you followed for your mother's advice. <laughs> Beth Fender, can you share an experience with us? Sure. You know, as I think of practice of the means of grace, it's, it's kind of hard to isolate one story. Um, I think that's because practicing the means of grace to me is kind of a lot like when my son was on the cross-country team when he was in high school. I imagine as he went out to run every day, probably he didn't have a big breakthrough every time he practiced, but over time, that regular practice really helped him to grow and to perform at his best as an athlete uh, on, the, on the varsity team. And I think it's like that with spiritual disciplines as well. But one story that stands out for me um, actually happened one day when I was driving to Garrett Evangelical for a class in spiritual formation. And on this particular day, I happened to be fasting. And I, I want to stop and say that I am by no means an expert on fasting. I'm certainly still learning um, this practice myself. But I stopped as I was on my way driving along at a Walmart that was near the interstate to get some juice because I, I do drink juice when I'm fasting from food. And, um, and I, on the way into the Walmart parking lot, I passed a man with a cardboard sign 
um, you know, that was asking, asking for food. And so God kind of impressed on me as I was on my way into Walmart that perhaps the food that I wasn't eating could be given to this man. And so along with my juice, I picked up some bananas and some protein bars. And on the way back out of the parking lot, I, I handed them to the man. And I don't really recall what we learned in class that evening, but the experience with the man with the sign um, taught me that when you're open to practicing the means of grace, that God may use those in ways that you don't even expect to uh, help you or even, even to push you to grow. Okay. So uh, one of those that you were... Um, practicing, we'll talk a little bit more, Steve Mansher will talk a little bit more about these later, practicing one of the means of, or the works of piety and ended up expressing one of the works of mercy. So uh, a, a great example. And Howard, Howard Willard, um, share with us, please, your experience. Sure. I, uh, I, I think back and, and realize how fortunate I was to grow up in a family in a, in a Methodist church environment that encouraged us, taught us, and, and more importantly, uh, really equipped us, as, especially as youth, to uh, to live the means of grace. Not not that we understood what the means of grace meant, but uh, I look back and realize I was surrounded by people that I, I knew were Christians. And I got to see how they behaved towards others and, and what actions they demonstrated. Uh, I, I, you know, I could read examples of what Jesus taught us in the Bible, but I, but I also got to see them lived out in real life as I was growing up. And I'm, I'm really thankful for those early lessons in discipleship and for those wonderfully patient adult leaders that took the time to encourage and, and teach us those. Those leaders really are, are what taught me to look forward to week-long work missions every summer with the senior high youth group, and it's something I, I still enjoy today uh, because I, I feel like one of my gifts is an enjoyment for building and, and fixing things. And that lifelong habit also led me to take part in an UMCOR training event on November 2nd of last year to get certified as an early responder at, uh, at disaster sites. And, you know, who, it's just strange. I mean, you go through something like that, and who would have ever guessed that just two weeks later on November 17th, an F4 tornado would rip its way through my own town of Washington, Illinois, where a 1,000 homes were damaged and 500 of them were completely gone. And what was really, what was really great to see is the, the, the team of people that went through that training with me were calling my cell phone within hours of that tornado passing through town and asking me, Howard, where do we need to be in the morning and what do we need to bring? So that next morning, you know, people were still in shock that first morning and, and were so grateful uh, and were really in disbelief that a group of people would show up so quickly and take vacation days to help them patch holes in their roof and to board up broken windows without any compensation. And so, you know, like those work missions, it always feels rewarding to help others in need, trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That The lesson that I learned from that tornado was a reminder to be ready to respond to God's nudging. Don't, you know, prepare. Don't worry, but prepare so that when uh, we can be ready for action, when that opportunity arises to share God's grace and, and God's love. So I look back, and I'm, I'm thankful for those memories of those wonderful disciples that showed me by example what living the means of grace looks like and I'll try to honor them by following in their footsteps. And it seems that you're doing that and we're we're grateful for that as well. So one turn you on to you, Steve Mansker, and let you share an experience or two with us. So. Well, thank you, Kathy. Um, well, like Steve, I my mind went back to my youth uh, with this question and uh, the, the means of grace that I think con I connect with most powerfully is since I was a young boy growing, I grew up in the Methodist church, you know, back in the days before we were United Methodists. Um, and just remember 
at Matamidi Methodist Church in Matamidi, Minnesota. Um, when I was a boy, it's where I was confirmed. We had, we probably had communion quarterly, and I remember the. It was served, and we were we were seated. Everyone seated in the pews, and we were served by passing trays with little pubes of cut up Wonder Bread, and then we. We'd eat that, and all, we'd all eat that together, and then we'd pa they'd pass the trays with the little shot glasses of grape juice, um, and we'd drink that. And even though I had, you know, I'm sure I had no idea w what this was really about, I knew it was important, and it was there was something special about it for me that really connected with me, and I always looked forward to that Sunday. Um, and then come forward many years um, to me now as an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church and being one who presides at the table. Um, that's one of the things, frankly, I miss the most as a pastor is that I don't get to do it often enough. <laughs> um, and just recently I, I taught uh, a course um, with some students at Ashland Theological Seminary up in Ashland, Ohio a couple weeks ago on the accountable discipleship, and I wanted it to be participative and experiential as well as doing some academic work. So we closed each day of the week with a brief 30-minute service of Holy Communion um, that I led, and um, it was a very rich time for me and for all the students. That's one of the, the things that the students told me that they really appreciated about that course was they knew at the end of the day they would be if they didn't, if I didn't feed them with the teaching, they at least get something good at the end of the day with the Lord's Supper, and uh, that's always connected with me. Thank you for sharing that. So, I can remember one of the first experiences that I had where was able to participate in communion daily, either receive or assisting with the service, and that that was I had never realized just how rich that could be doing daily communion. So. So thank you all for sharing and for um, sharing a bit of yourselves with our audience tonight. We're glad to have the conversation that's going and um, uh, see some of you responding already to some of the things that are being shared. So we encourage you to do that. And as we said, if you have questions you want to ask of, of our guests, um, please include those as well. As we move now into really the, the meat of what we want to talk about tonight, um, that is about the means of grace, what they are, how, they're, how they are avenues for spiritual growth, um, how they enhance relationships, and also, as one of you commented, make us more open to those nudgings and those, those, those pushes. Um, so we're going to begin with you, Steve Bryant, to just give us a bit of, of general history, we'll say, and then we're going to have Steve Mansker talk about why these are important to us as, as United Methodists. But give us a bit of history of the means of grace as a part of the Christian tradition and also how they really <coughs> became formalized. Okay. Um, just a little, uh, not, not, maybe not as much of a history lesson as the PowerPoint suggests, which might take a little longer. Let me uh, just focus primarily on the uh, biblical background and, and a little bit about early Christians. The means of grace in the Bible refer to the practices of the faith community by which we, basically, by which we allow God to be God in our lives, by which we allow God to participate in our lives and also the means by which we, in turn, participate in God's life and in God's work and mission in the world. Um, we become vessels through which God's love uh, is at work in us, but also through us uh, in the world. So I think that's, Douglas Steer uh, once wrote, or once, once said to us in a, in a teaching session a number of years ago, um, the wind of God is always blowing, but we must hoist our sails. The, and so the wind of God is, is, is the affirmation of God's presence, always at work in the world, but the means of grace uh, are the sails. And so we, we hoist our sails through a variety of means, inward and outward and corporate means, by which we uh, 
the, we move in the spirit of Jesus Christ. We live our lives in that spirit, and we make his presence, make the God's love uh, visible in this world. I think the easiest, the most natural way to see the means of grace at work uh, in the Bible is, especially in the New Testament, is just to look at the life of Jesus and, uh, and, and to look at the life of the disciples with him. If you just think about uh, what Jesus did, when Jesus called the disciples, he called them and invited them uh, to become a part of his life and to take up his practice to take up his way of life. And we see that, how that happens. Uh, it, it's not an invitation to, to uh, receive in some mystical way a supernatural knowledge of him by simply opening their heart to him and all of a sudden this happens and happens immediately. It's rather very natural. They, he invites them into relationship, into his company, and to walk with them, to hang out with him, and to do what's very natural. We all understand how this works they have the opportunity to get to know him and to get to know God through him by spending time with him, by, um, by listening to him, by listening to his interpretation of the Torah, uh, by having conversation with him and with one another in his presence, by uh, participating in his, in his uh, ministry toward other people as, as he reaches out uh, to the untouchables, uh, they participate in that by their presence and then by their actions in time. Um, as he receives those uh, whom society has rejected, uh, they are there with him. And in time, that practice becomes their practice. And uh, as, he, as the, he, Jesus sends them out in twos to be in ministry and to go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God and bring peace to the households, and then he gathers them back. And we see how Jesus involves them in the rhythm of his own life, a rhythm of going out and coming back, of uh, action and prayer, of engagement and withdrawal. And, and we see that in Mark 6, how he brings them back together. And uh, they gather around him and share, tell him all that they have done and taught. And then he invites them to a, a time of rest. So you get that rhythm. And the means of grace are all about that rhythm in which... Uh, our life with God in, in the love of God and our life in love of neighbor and our life together in the, in the community of faith, they're all mixed together and they're mixed together in particular practices that, uh, that we name and the Wesleyan, uh, our Wesleyan heritage is named uh, so, so specifically. So I, I know we're going to go into kind of categorizing the means of grace and doing that in a minute, but I, I realize we're going with the assumption that people know what we're talking about as far as practices, and I think many of our, our listeners do, but let's just briefly kind of review what we're talking about just as some common practices that Christians do, that this isn't some big mysterious um, set of practices that we're probably not already engaged in. So I know you're going to talk more in a minute, Stephen Mansker, about this, but um, one of you just briefly named some of what we're talk about when we say the means of grace. So, go ahead. Well, I think first of all, we, we want to name the, the actual the faith community, that the community itself becomes the means of grace. Uh, and that community then is, is, uh, is knitted, knit together uh, in a lot of common practices that have to do with our common prayer, that is our worship life, our, our prayer in, in small groups or family life as well, and our, in our solitary prayer. So prayer, corporate and individual, um, uh, the searching of the scriptures, ongoing uh, reading and meditation of scripture, the uh, fasting, uh, abstinence, um, um, it works. We just have to get some examples. Then, we don't have to use the whole. Works of mercy, and Steve will have to explicate yeah. those more clearly, I think, as John Wesley laid them out. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. So, and so we do want to turn to you, Stephen Mansford, to talk about this now. What sort of our our Wesleyan heritage, United Methodist heritage, with the means of grace, and then how those are lived out today, so, or we continue to live them and practice them. Okay. Um, yeah, the the Wesley brothers um, learned the means of grace from childhood 
they, from the, the home that they lived in with their mother and father, Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Samuel, of course, was the director of St. Andrew's Church in uh, Epworth, um, where all the children were, um, were born and baptized. Um, and uh, the Wesley home was uh, a place of very disciplined Christian formation. Uh, in fact, uh, I think you can say John was very, I'm sure both the brothers were very much formed by particularly their mother. Um, and I think particularly John was very much influenced by his mother, Susanna. Um, the pre so they had, they had learned these disciplines of, of prayer, of worship, um, sacraments, the Lord's Supper, um, searching the scriptures, the ministry of the word um, were just ingrained in their, in their lives from very early on. Um, they took that then when they went off, you know, to school, both of them, both the boys went to school in London, uh, John at Charterhouse and Charles at Westminster. Um, and then as young men, um, after their time at Oxford University, um, where they were part, you know, Charles formed the Holy Club and invited John to come in and lead them. They started then discovering th their practice of prayer and worship and scripture led them to works of mercy, you know, going into the prison um, in Oxford and visiting, taking clothes and medicine and food to, to the prisoners and to the poor of Oxford. Um, they were then led, you know, in, as missionaries to Georgia, where John, particularly John, came in contact with a group of uh, German pietists known as Moravians, um, who had a huge impact on his life. Um, so the, the practice of the means of grace in the Wesleyan tradition as they you know, were developed over time by John, sort of systematized by John in the early Methodist societies, particularly after the, his uh, Aldersgate experience on May 24, 1738. Um, our pra their practices, I think, as Steve alluded to earlier, of, that open our hearts and our minds and our hands to God. It's, it's, you know, and also it's the, the understanding that, that being a Christian is much more than simply giving intellectual assent or agreement to uh, a faith statement or doctrines or creeds. It, it's more than simply saying, Jesus Christ, I believe Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. Then Wesley would say, well, if that's so, and I'm sure it is, then that should affect, be seen in the way you live your life. And if you say you love God and you love Christ with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then think about someone that you love. You want to spend time with that person. You want to get to know that person, right? Well, that's what the means of grace are. It's the practices that God has given us to spend time in God's presence to get to know who God is and for God to really get to know, to open ourselves up to God um, in our lives. Um, so that's what the, both the works of piety and the works of mercy are ultimately about. It's about um, knowing God and being known by God um, through these practices. That, that involve our, because God loves our whole body, not just our soul and our mind. God loves our whole self. So these means of grace involve our whole bodies, right? Um, so they're practices that, that, co that help us to cooperate with what God wants to do in us through the power of the Holy Spirit and to, to use Wesley's language to form, to holy tempers in our soul, to transform our tempers and our affections, how we behave and what we love. Um, so the holy tempers, people are probably wondering, what the heck is he talking about? Because we don't use that. We don't we probably, I don't, I don't wonder if anybody has heard a sermon on the holy tempers. Um, you may not have heard a sermon on the holy tempers, but you have probably heard a sermon on the fruit of the spirit. And that's what the holy tempers are. 
um, found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are all reflections of the character of Jesus Christ, and that's what God wants to form in us, is wants a disciple of Jesus Christ. The goal of discipleship is to become like Jesus, and the way we become like Jesus is by imitating his way of life. And that's what the means of grace are intended to do. So what John Wesley did, am I? You're fine. Am I fine? Okay. <laughs> um, so what John Wesley did was he simply, he, he developed a, a method, that's why we're called Methodists, is to, to help people become like Jesus. Um, so part of that is, an important part of that tradition is the Methodist rule, the United Methodist rule of life, that we know as the general rules that John Wesley wrote in uh, 1743 to help provide some what is called, is, you know, he called Christian discipline. This is what discipline is ultimately about. It's helping to order our lives along in accordance with an alignment with Christ and with the, with the Holy Spirit. So we do that by obeying Jesus' teachings to love God with all your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the general rules is all about, is to give us very simple, direct guidance as to how to do that. And we do that by doing no harm, by avoiding evil, doing good, by giving food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, giving drinks to the thirsty people, uh, welcoming the strangers, um, sharing, introducing people to Christ is, a, is doing good and a, an act of mercy in, in Wesley's mind. Um, so that's how we love our neighbor as ourselves, is doing no harm and doing good, balanced by what Wesley calls attending upon all the ordinances of God or practicing the works of piety. Um, those disciplines, both social and personal, that nurture our love for God. Um, and they are the, um, I've got them right here, the public worship of God, the ministry of the word, uh, the rhetoric expounded, the supper of the Lord, family and private prayer, searching the scriptures and fasting or abstinence. Um, so a way that's helped me to understand this is you think about the Christian life is shaped by the cross. And so the vertical beam of the cross are those works of piety. It's our relationship with, with God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And the way we nurture and grow and get to know who God is and open ourselves to God and his grace is through these practices of prayer, worship, sacrament, scripture, and fasting. Um, and if we, if we say we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then that means we must love what God loves and love those whom God loves. And the way we do that is through practicing the works of mercy. That's the horizontal beam of the cross. With our arms outstretched, by feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, welcoming the strangers, visiting prisoners, caring for the sick, being peacemakers and witnesses for justice and witnesses for Jesus Christ in the world. Um, so these are the means of grace in the Wesleyan tradition. Thank you. You gave us a lot of, well, no, give us a lot of really good information. I mean, a lot of our heritage and where these came from and also how they fit together and that it's not, I think it's fair to say and correct me, I'm sure if, if I'm wrong, that this is perhaps somewhat the unique way that the United Methodists or those of the Wesleyan tradition is that we have the emphasis on both, that it's not just piety, it's not just mercy, it's, it's that they it's, come together. And that, and that is a unique characteristic, I think, of the Wesleyan tradition is that it's, it's rarely, if ever, either or anything. Right. It's almost always both and. So it's always mercy and piety. You can't, they all, they must go together. You cannot separate them. And, and we get into trouble when we do, when we emphasize one and de-emphasize the other is when we get in trouble. 
um, and we get deformed in our discipleship, I think. Howard, I think from what you shared with us earlier and your um, work particularly with the um, Disciple Bible um, Outreach Ministries is um, a beautiful example of how these fit together. So I want you to talk more about how Disciple Bible Study in Prison draws you closer both to God and to those men with whom you're working through the scripture study and, and visiting the prisoner. Tell us more about that. Sure, Kathy. Um, yeah, you know, really, I guess it, uh, every week we begin the Bible study with prayer, and, and then we, we close in prayer. And and I'm just regularly overwhelmed during those prayers that uh, by a feeling of, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Um, these guys are fathers, husbands, sons, brothers, and, and they all realize their mistakes have created immense hardship on their family. You know, as if as if a prison sentence isn't enough punishment, they, they have to sit in their cell and live with that reality, knowing there isn't anything they can do from prison to physically help relieve their family's struggles that, that they have greatly created. So, you know, I, I pray for these men, their families, and their situations every night. I know their names. I, I can see their faces as I pray for them. And you know, most of them are not hardened career criminals. M many of them just saw at, at the, what at the time looked like an easier, more lucrative path, and, and they just ended up making some bad decisions in life and, and got caught. Um, because of these new brothers in Christ, I, I have felt a renewed purpose this year for my own prayer time with God. I, my own blessings seem much larger, and my own problems seem much smaller. Um, when, I, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I immediately begin praying for the, for the guys. Um, besides lifting up the prayer concerns that, that they share, my, my prayer is that God might use us to help these men become true disciples for, for each other, for the other 1,200 inmates uh, out in the compound of that prison, and for their families back home. We as a team pray that God will bless them and grant them the peace that only He can provide, and that they come to know that God truly loves them no matter what, and so do we. Thank you, and I, I know they they experience that, and you're going to tell us a little bit more about that later on how they're they're wanting to to live out some of that. Um, Beth, from your perspective, um, share with us some how you see the works of piety and the works of mercy related. Well, I think Howard really illustrated this well with the um, the experience that he has of, of going into the prison, driving him deeper into prayer, you know, but also incorporating that, that work of piety, the, the Bible study, in into a work of mercy. Um, even, even my story about fasting and the man with the cardboard sign, I think, is an example of this. I see that the means of grace really are a cycle. Um, and one sort of naturally leads to the other in, in sometimes unpredictable ways. Um, the, the works of piety help us to connect to God, and they, they nourish and prepare us to be engaged in the works of mercy. They also challenge us. If we, if we really take Scripture seriously, it's, it's hard to avoid a certain sense of urgency about being in ministry with those on the margins. And the works of mercy also help us to connect to God as they connect us with our neighbor because they drive us deeper in prayer and scripture and Christian conferencing to make sense of what we've experienced and uh, to sustain us along the way. You know, Steve mentioned earlier that for the Wesley brothers, um, the works of piety came first, and then they went out into the prisons and so forth. But I think, especially today, a lot of people who you know, maybe are not a part of a faith community, they might be drawn to getting involved with something like building a Habitat for Humanity house or serving in a soup kitchen. 
not necessarily from a faith perspective, but just because those are nice things to do and good ways to be involved in your community. But I think as they get into that, um, it, it brings up questions about the people that you encounter. And if they encounter Christians and start to have those conversations asking, you know, why do you do this? Why is this so important to you? They might be open to maybe opening a Bible for the first time or, or getting involved in a Bible study or attending worship. Um, so I, and, I, and then I think that then drives us back out into the world um, to get involved in the works of mercy. So it's really, really a cycle that I think you can jump into at any point. And as you said, it, it's different starting places for different people depending what their experience is and even what, what their temperaments are, what, their, um, what draws them to, to where, they, where they start. Um, we've talked about that these are practices, that they're, they're disciplines, um, talked about, um, our guests have talked about how their experiences of drawing the mirror to other people, um, opening them to God's leading, drawing nearer to God. But we also know these are um, practices that we can choose to participate in or not participate in as we want and, and such. And um, a lot of times we want to do these, but it's kind of hard to do it, especially if it's a new practice or other things kind of start interfering with the time that we have set aside. So what we want to talk about now is as these are a means of growth as well as a means of grace, um, how we can encourage and support people in their practices and even how we can be supported in our practices. And uh, Steve Mansker, I know, um, like you to talk a bit about accountability groups and or small groups, how a small Christian community can be helpful. Okay. Um, well, I want to start that by um, giving Wesley's definition of means of grace that I meant to do earlier, but. <laughs> Uh, got away from it. Uh, and I think this is important that we hear from Wesley himself. Uh, and this is for those, um, if you're interested, you can go and find this. It's from uh, his sermon. Um, I can't remember the number. Um, but the title is Means of Grace. Just do a Google search. And you'll find it at General Board of Global Ministries website. They have all his sermons there. And the sermon titled Means of Grace, where he focuses on prayer, Scripture and the Lord's Supper, um, and in that ser earlier in that sermon, he this, he gives this very important definition of means of grace: that they are outward signs, words, or actions ordained of God and appointed for this end to be the ordinary channels. That's the important to be the ordinary channels, whereby He might convey to people preventing, justifying, or sanctifying grace. So it's like Steve said, it's where we connect with God and cooperate then with, with the grace of God um, at work in our lives and in the world around us. Um, so a, uh, small groups, I think, particularly in the Wesleyan tradition, are essential um, for our Christian formation and our discipleship. Um, they help us develop relationships um, of mutual trust, support, and accountability that we need to grow in our discipleship. Um, we are relational, just as God is relational, we, created in the image of God, are relational creatures. So the way we come to know how to love God is by loving, being in relationships with people that God sends into our lives through baptism and bringing us into the church. So that's not going to happen if all we do is show up on Sunday morning for worship. You need to be part of a, a smaller group where you can develop those, those relationships of trust and mutual love and support. Um, they are what I like to call the method of Methodism. Um, the early Methodist societies were networks of small groups that met people where they were and helped them to grow and mature in loving God and neighbors. Many of the, I think the audience are familiar with a quote from, in which Wesley wrote, there is no holiness but social holiness. 
And by social holiness, Wesley means that Christians are formed best in society, meaning in the community of the church and in the relationships formed in small groups that meet weekly to watch over one another in love, is his words, in order to help one another to grow in holiness of heart and life, which is loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and loving our, those whom God loves. The weekly small group meetings is where we take a compass heading for our walk with Christ in the world. It's a time when fellow group members may help us make needed course corrections and to receive encouragement that we need each week. The process of weekly accountability and support for discipleship helps us to live a balanced life in Christ. The group helps us to make sure that we are following all of the teachings of Jesus, not only the ones that we like or that we're temperamentally inclined to practice. Um, when we give an account of our discipleship guided by the general rules, the group helps us make sure we are practicing both works of piety and works of mercy together. Um, the mutual accountability and support given and received in small groups contributes to the disciple-making process, and such small groups are where disciples who make disciples are formed, disciples who disciple others. Right. So if you know, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. For that to happen, we need lay people who are disciples who can disciple others, and that happens in small groups. Um, so when small groups help people in routine, to routinely practice the means of grace and grow in holiness of heart and life, they equip Christians to join Christ in his mission of preparing this world for the coming reign of God. That's why small groups are the method of Methodism. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, Beth, you um, at one point were leading what were called Deeper Still events in Illinois Great Rivers, and I know you still are working with retreats and events, so tell us about some of your experiences, those as a way to support people in their, in their journey of, the, of practicing the means of grace. Sure. Well, as part of the New Streams team in the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, it, it occurred to us fairly early on that um, we now have some, some wonderful resources. I know we're going to talk about resources a little later on, but some resources to teach about the means of grace. But really, you learn the means of grace by practicing them. And so we started a series of events um, called the Deeper Still events, designed both to educate people about particular means of grace, but also, and, and I think even more importantly, to provide opportunities to experience them and to see how they're related and to actually practice them. And our initial purpose in this series was that local churches could replicate what they experienced in these events in their particular local church, in their context. Although we did end up bringing in some speakers from outside the conference um, to make sure that we were providing some quality teaching as well as the experience and practice. But one of our events focused on the Lord's Supper and feeding the hungry. And I just wanted to share this one as an example. We, we experienced several services of Holy Communion. We served in a feeding ministry at one of our downtown churches, our large downtown churches. We also provided some time for participants to engage in some Christian conferencing to process what they'd learned and experienced and to, think, to begin to think about what they could do with this when they went back to their own church. And after the event, one of the participants actually wrote on the evaluation form, I will never again receive communion without thinking of people who don't have enough to eat. And this was really the kind of transformation that we were aiming for. And again, I think it shows that connection between um, the various ones of the, of the means of grace. Well, another one of our events that we did in that series connected searching the scriptures 
and ministry with the imprisoned. And uh, that event really produced fruit beyond what we even dreamed or expected, because as a result of that event, we uh, were able to form Disciple Bible Outreach Ministries of Illinois, in, in which Howard participates. And we were able to do that uh, in partnership with the Northern Illinois Conference, because we have two conferences here in Illinois, and the prison system is statewide. It just, it just shows you that God's grace is powerful. And when we're open to it, uh, you just never really know what, what might come of it and, and what fruit um, just might come out of that. Thanks, Beth. Howard, that's a natural entree for you to talk a little bit more about how you, how you followed the nudgings to get involved in that and, and what has supported you to stay there. Sure, Kathy, you bet. Yeah, you know, you, you heard me mention earlier that I'm still still trying to learn to spend at least as much time listening for God's voice and being sensitive to his nudgings as I spend doing the talking to God. Uh, back in 2001, I'd, I'd been fortunate to have been working closely with our high school MYF group, the, the senior high group, for about seven years. But, but at that time, I was relocated about 100 miles away for work. So you know, I was able to continue going on those annual work missions that I enjoyed so much, but it, it didn't take long before I, I really missed that weekly interaction and, and the growing that we enjoyed together with those kids. I, so I, I began looking for a new way to get engaged again, and, and I picked up a book called Prison Ministry, Understanding Prison Culture Inside and Out by Lenny Spital. And I, I, if I could see him, I would thank Lenny for helping open, open me up to a new passion uh, and for spurring me into preparation. I, as I read other books by men like Chuck Colson, I, I began to feel this indeed might, might be a nudging. Uh, and, and wouldn't you know it, I mean, just, just like God, when I was starting to wonder how I might possibly as an individual be able to take action on, on this possible calling, I opened the Methodist Current Newsletter and my eyes were drawn to an article about the group Beth was referring to that had just held an exploratory meeting about forming an Illinois affiliate of, of D-Bomb National. So I went online, I googled D-Bomb, I read about their mission and it said, hey, their mission is to take Disciple Bible Study Series into the prisons to give inmates something bigger than themselves or their gang back home to believe in. The statistics were clear that you know, an inmate that establishes a daily practice of Bible reading and prayer is significantly less likely to return to prison when they get out. The material also reminded me uh, that for the inmates that may never be released, it's also critical to have some sense of hope and some sense of peace in that unimaginably chaotic culture of a prison. And as I read that article, I just kind of said, okay, God, um, I get it. Um, so I picked up the phone. I called Mark DeHorty and, and Beth Fender to get involved with the team they were building. And that was, that was March of 2013. And in December of 2013, we began our first disciple study group with these first 16 inmates. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey so far. I'm sure it has. It would be interesting to talk with you about it in another um, 16 weeks or so when you when you have finished this this first study. So maybe we'll have an opportunity to do that. So I'd Brian, love you, we want to have you here for, talk a little bit about supporting each other in the means of grace, particularly in your light of your experiences outside the United States in hmm. in the central conferences. But in fact, in fact, made it just. Uh, begin with a little bit about my own experience sure. with this and then build to that. Okay. Because I want to pick up on, uh, just say a word about kind of connecting back to what Steve Master was talking about in my own life. It, I, for many years now, I have been, I have always been a part of a, uh, of a small covenant group ever since uh, um, I really came to life. It came to life in the Christian faith, I think, somehow or the other. Um, I've been a part of a, either a Walk to Emmaus reunion group or a Covenant Discipleship group. I'm currently in a Covenant Discipleship group, but it's been very important to me. And I just want to mention that um, 
Uh, in addition to that, I've found it to be very effective in terms of supporting people in this to, um, as a pastor, to invite people to join me for special stretches of time in the practices of the means of grace around particular needs. So it's one thing to be in my own group, but I found it's one thing, and it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to have a lot of groups formed. Would anybody like to join them? But it's another thing to say, would you join me? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm extending an invitation to anyone here who feels drawn by the Spirit right now to join me at 7 o'clock on Wednesday mornings or at 7 o'clock at night or whatever. And we're going to join together in a time of prayer and listening, reading the Scripture, and a, and a time of reflection on how God is calling us to be of service in our church and community. So join me on this journey. And I've always found that people respond and will join me in that if the leader extends the invitation. I was going to say, so it's not just saying, I ought to do this, but I'm on this journey with you. Exactly. And it's not as just, a, it really as a peer, if it, you're at one of those. As a peer. Things. It's not just this is things you ought to be doing, but I'm, I'm on a journey. Uh, let's, let's journey together. And we'll do it for this stretch of time. And, and creating opportunities for people, like Beth said, to practice uh, what we're talking about, to actually actually creating practice spaces uh, is so important. And people, so, so many people do not find opportunities to learn uh, things as basic as how, how do we actually pray. And we have to create spaces for that. About the central conferences, my work overseas um, has very, been very illuminating in this regard. Uh, Christian community, the fabric of Christian community in our United Methodist churches in Africa and in the Philippines, and let me focus on Africa for a minute, really is the class meetings. And uh, the, early, the early Methodist tradition has carried on across now for you know decades and centuries. And um, the class meetings are the place in, of, form, of Christian formation and, and Christian support, mutual support, both in prayer relationships and also in outward ministries of, share, of acts of mercy and supporting uh, people in need. Um, people share what they have. Um, the, the class meetings are the place where new churches are born. The, the class meets, a, a large class meeting may split off and actually go off and, and begin a new body that becomes a new church. Everything in the, it, it kind of centers around and comes in and out of the class meeting dynamic. And where the class meeting is weak, uh, there's deep concern because it affects the whole life of the church. Um, so I've been very impressed overseas at the, at the importance of this method of Methodism uh, in, in, um, in our churches, uh, in, these, in these other areas of what we have to learn from them. That's helpful, and that just kind of underscores that it, it still is making a huge difference in, in a lot of people's lives, which, which we know that, but it's that where the church is growing, this is where it's, that, that's such a key part of it. I think it's kind of interesting to note from some of your comments um, that while this is a very, this is an hour long that we'll be together in this small community of, of Christians, but that some of you are already sensing some nudges as one of our um, listeners commented that he was making a note, to, kind of depending on uh, Howard's comments, to check what his local jail chaplain to see what it would take to bring disciple into that setting and such. So you never know. <laughs> um, one thing that we did want to point out is we've talked a lot about how we can um, support each other through ongoing small groups, through um, special events, but we did want to lift up a study that is available from the upper room called Opening Ourselves to God's Grace. And it is, uh, as you can see on the slide, it's a four-session small group study on the means of grace. Um, it does have a CD and, and video with it, but it would be the kind of thing that you could do as a, as a church, as a Sunday school group, as a small group, whatever. But with well, There's a six-week Bible study included in okay. it. Okay. So six-week Bible study and then four-week 
video study, it looks mm -hmm. like. So anyway, so that, again, would be a, a resource for you to do some, some further exploration. And once you get through that, then there are, are many things on the, on the particular practices you might want to look at. So um, we are drawing, getting close to our, our closing time for the evening. But before we do, um, we want to talk just a little bit about the means of grace and Lent because, again, as we talk about supporting each other on our journeys, uh, many of us just choose either to take something on or to take something off, in a sense, um, during Lent. And a week from tonight, we will have completed the second day of our Lenten journey for, for this year. Um, Ash Wednesday, those of us that are able to attend services will be encouraged to keep a Holy Lent. And so what I'd, I'd like to do is, um, and again, I'm going to start with Steve Manster just because we, we've got a little bit more um, formal presentation, but some things that you would, that our guests would encourage you maybe to think about as you're looking at what you might want to do as your Lenten practices um, to open you to God's grace during this coming Lent. So Steve Mansker, um, talk to us about the baptism study that you're encouraging people to consider. Well, yeah, I because Lent has traditionally, um, you know, for centuries been a series, a, a, a season during which people are prepared for baptism. Um, and they would be baptized, you know, historic, you know, Easter is one of the major baptismal Sundays of the church. Um, so it's appropriate that we spend some time during the six weeks of Lent to um, reflect on the meaning of, bapt of our baptism. Um, there is, you know, a very fine resource that was published by the General Board of Discipleship um, based on the, the official teaching on baptism of the United Methodist Church called By Water and the Spirit by the late, great, um, oh, I can't think of her Gail name, Felton. Gail, Gail Felton. Felton. Yes, mm -hmm. Gail Felton, thank you. I knew I was going to draw a blank on her name. Um, so that, I, that's one way of doing it. Another would be simply to take out your hymn, the hymnal and... Um, and, and I particularly want, and I've done some writing about this, and you know, to reflect on, um, you know, of particular interest to, to this discussion of the means of grace, reflect upon the relationship between the three questions asked of persons to be baptized, or when we reaffirm our baptism, and their correlation with the three general rules. So, for example, the, the first question is, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Yes, by doing no harm and avoiding evil of every kind. You know, that's connection with the first of the general rules. The second question, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Yes, by doing good by being in every way merciful. And then Wesley goes on, you know, by feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, um, visiting the prisons and caring for the sick and so on. And finally, do you confess Jesus Christ as your savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church? Yes, by attending upon all the ordinances of God through the public worship of God, the ministry of the word, the Lord's Supper, family and private prayer, searching the scriptures, and fasting or abstinence. After six weeks of studying and reflecting upon the baptismal covenant, it'd be also very powerful to include, a, you know, a baptism or more, you know, one or more, or a congregational reaffirmation of the baptismal covenant on Easter Sunday. Um, but I think that, that would be um, an appropriate, and I don't know, that's what I'm going to be doing for Lent. Right. And we appreciate your sharing that. So we do want to hear from, from the rest of you. Um, Beth, um, what would you encourage people to consider doing as maybe on either familiar practices or taking on a new one during Lent? 
Sure. I think Lent is a great opportunity to try something new in terms of a new discipline because we know in advance that it's only for six weeks. So if you don't like it, you can always stop doing it, and and it works out very well that way. But um, I think it's also a good time to renew our practice of familiar disciplines. Um, Steve mentioned Gail Felton. I'm going to be teaching a, a study of, of her, uh, This Holy Mystery, about Holy Communion during Lent. Uh, we have a group um, that made up of United Methodists from all the different United Methodist churches in our community that get together every Lent for a study. Um, and it, it's a great opportunity to, to join with people that you might not see at other times and try out something. You know, maybe you're not normally in a Sunday school class, or maybe you teach a Sunday school class, and this is an opportunity for you to, to join in a study that might be being offered during Lent. Um, I find it, it really, to go back to the conversation about accountability, teaching these kinds of studies really helps me with my own accountability because I can't very well teach a class about a discipline that I don't practice myself. So, um, so even, even teaching a study can be a great way to, um, to engage with the season of Lent. Thank you. And I, I like your idea of bringing, having the group be drawn from all of the churches in your community and stuff. I think that's a, a neat way to get together with our United Methodist brothers and sisters that sometimes we don't do that very often. So, Howard, what can you share with us? You bet. Um, I'll, I'll share back again a, another story I'm learning to appreciate from the from the guys we're working with in the in the series. We're we're on lesson nine out of the thirty four week disciples series and and we're starting to see relationships and, and trust building uh, between our facilitation team and the inmates but but more importantly between the inmates themselves. They're they're really talking openly now and, and we look forward to what God will do through these sixteen men who are who are working really hard to become disciples in a very tough environment. One of the one of the men uh, recently commented. He said he looked across at the room and he said, "Guys, as we get into this Bible study and actually become disciples, how are we going to act differently towards each other? Out there in the yard, in the dining hall, wherever we're at, we all need to think about how we'll use what we learn to make changes in our behavior that others can see." And when I, when I think about, you know, giving something up for Lent, trying to make a difference, I'm, I'm inspired by the fact that these guys have decided to try something uh, inside the prison. I'm inspired by the fact that they're now buying essentials. They've decided to buy toothbrushes, toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, soap, etc., for the new arrivals that come into the prison and most of the time come in with absolutely nothing. So these guys at their 12 cents per hour wages that they earn from the prison workshop, these guys have found a way to be in mission to show God's grace within the prison population, giving from what little they have, inviting others to join them in Christian brotherhood. And I just, when they told me what they decided they wanted to do, I said, once again, you guys are teaching us. Like I said, you're going to have a lot more stories and, and great stories to, to share. And uh, as, as you're being being fed, as you're feeding others. So, Steve Bryant, we're going to give you close to the last word here. <laughs> well, I'll lead a class on uh, Sunday mornings, always when I'm not out of, out of town. And the practice, uh, in, I'm going to add to the group meeting uh, for be beginning with Lent and beginning this coming Sunday, actually, as we begin to enter into that this new season, um, will be to, to ask the question, uh, in this season leading toward Easter, uh, through the crucifixion story, uh, that which is about dying and rising, what is it that, uh, that we hear God calling us to take up and to let go? Um, that is, uh, what is it we need to let go of that's limiting our capacity to love? What is it we need to take up that, that would uh, be an exercise in, our, in the capacity God gives us to love, to love God and love neighbor as God's beloved? And so I think that for me to make that a weekly reflection in the group every week, uh, the answer may be different each week. 
So the practice <laughs> will be to reflect together on the, that question of taking up and letting go. What comes out of that practice every week will be different. And we'll do that, we'll have that reflection uh, as a group and individually. Thank you for sharing that. Thank all of you for what you have, have shared this evening. Um, before we, we formally close, um, we want to lift up a few of the resources that are available from the upper room to use during Lent. Um, three studies, A World Worth Saving, which I have noticed some of you have already said you are going to be using this year as the new study. Um, and. Uh, as it says, Lenten Spiritual Practices for Action. So um, it, that one will be an interesting one. Um, and then two of them that are a, a year or so old, but um, all good studies that we would encourage you if you've not um, picked something that you want to dig into a bit during Lent, you might look at those. There is also an online retreat available. Um, again, a way to be a part through a virtual community. Um, on the awkward season, um, you can see the information here. I, this is um, done in uh, collaboration between the Upper Room and the um, Southwestern College through their Be a Disciple program. And so that is something that if you're interested in, you have the website there, myupperroom.org, and you can gather the information that you need about that. Um, this has been a good hour. We thank all of you who have been listening and as you've made your, your comments. Um, glad you've been with us tonight. Um, again, we want to thank our guests, Steve Mansker, Beth Fender, Howard Willard, and Steve Bryant for getting us started um, with this year's series. And we really do thank all of you for being a part of this tonight. Um, and all of you, we want to invite you to be uh, put our next webinar on your calendar and plan to join us. At that point, we're going to start ex going into depth with some of the particular practices. And so on Tuesday, March 25th, Tuesday rather than Thursday in March, we'll be coming together again at 7 p.m. Central Time um, and looking at fasting, the Lord's Supper, and feeding the hungry. And so we, we do hope that you'll come back, um, invite your friends. <laughs> we'll be um, promoting this in a number of ways um, as the website is on there, but you will be receiving more information and, and ways that you can register. So again, we thank all of you on behalf of The Upper Room and Interpreter Magazine for joining us, and we hope you'll be back with us in March.